We said goodbye to the Mitchell River and headed up and around Cape Bougainville to the aptly named Freshwater Bay. Well, some places we like, uh, not because they're spectacular and magnificent, this is just pretty. It's very pretty. Um, but it's very convenient. It is. It's only about, the boat's about 200 metres away by dinghy, 300 metres. Yep. Uh, and we can access it at most parts of the tide. Uh, we just can't get here at low tide, so yep. it's pretty you can good. Just tie that dinghy up, it's a little walk up. Mm -hmm. um, We've set up the hose, we can have bath time, wash our heads, mm. it's all good. And, and rewatering is going to be so easy. So for us, it's a pretty place, but it's easy. It's easy. <laughs> right. It's, easy. it's time to relax. So yeah. That's, no missions. <laughs> that's freshwater bay. <laughs> When you're in wild places, you're going to have to share your living space with uh, the local animals. But here we found this olive python, and they're pretty shy and retiring. So we moved it out of the swimming hole. We were going to be here for a while, so we thought it'd just be more comfortable if it just went elsewhere. These are not a dangerous snake by any means. Um, and there's no problem picking this one up. And he did. He just kind of took off, none the worse for wear. So native K-pop flower, what do you think it tastes like? I think it tastes like propolis, bee pollen. Huh. Yeah. There you go. Okay. And there's actually some fresher ones there. I can see there's one that's quite a pale cream colour. Yeah. Uh, further around the tree. There? Yeah. That looks more old. There's not much to the old native K-pop trees at this stage, is there? They've dropped all their leaves. Just the yellow flowers. And the buds. Yeah. So the that, they're a distinctive, uh, distinctive plant around here, just really barren, but a, a splash of yellow in the bush. Mm, pretty, pretty cool. Pretty, I reckon. Yeah, later on those, those green pods will dry out and then they'll open up and they'll be all fluffy seed pods and people used to use it as a kapok substitute. So here's a nest of some uh, green tree ants in tropical Australia. These things are just strictly arboreal. They live up in the trees. Um, they'll go down in the land to just generally murder and bring things back for food. But um, yeah, so they'll live up in the trees. They actually use their larvae to make that white silk. They'll hold the little baby ants in their jaws. One of them will pinch it and it just sort of puts that silk out. Um, and they weave the, weave the leaves together by using the secretions of their babies. So there you go. And um, here's a nice picture of one of these little ants. They're super aggressive. And it doesn't, doesn't matter that I'm a, like 10,000 times bigger, it's doing its best to kill me. So, just going for it. <laughs> we're here at Freshwater Bay and we're deep frying oysters. What? Because it's too messy to do it on the boat. Why are you outside deep frying oysters? because it just makes such a mess in our boat. We tried deep frying when we were in Ningaloo 
We made chips and we deep fried squid and we made a real big mess in the room. <laughs> there was right. hot oil everywhere so we made a rule that we weren't going to do any deep frying on the boat anymore. All right. So well, here we are. Let's have a look at the setup then. So anyone that knows us knows that we love hanging pots over fire by some various means. We haven't gone very complicated. It's just a stick stuck in some rocks with a fire underneath. There's the main fire running lengthways with the wind. And here is some small kindling pieces that we can add just boost up the heat but they'll, uh, they'll flash out so we can sort of heat it up, let it fade and uh, control the, the heat of the fire that way. Um, we've made a batter here with stone ground flour, cayenne, salt and pepper and a bit of water. Yep, that flour was hand ground by Pascal herself and we collected these oysters yesterday. Yeah. Here's some we prepared earlier. Alright, let's do it. Righto Pasky, that oil looks hot. How are we going to check it? Uh, just pop a stick in, see if it bubbles. Yep. <laughs> yep, alright. Yep. Pass the test. We'll just put this to the end there to control the heat a little bit. Oh, yeah. Let's have a look. Yeah. Pretty they good. good. <laughs> so that was kicking off pretty good. So we've just slid this along off the fire just to one side. Back over the fire. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're not just yet. If we want to boost it, we can throw a few little ones in there. Mm -hmm. So there we go, we've sped the fire up, pushed everything closer together again, and thrown in some small kindling so she's just starting to tick off. <laughs> Yum. They're pretty good. They're really good. That's what they look like. Yeah, you can see they get They are, they're crunchy. Alright Pascal, there's the oysters. So what's what's next on the menu? Well we're gonna try deep frying some fish wings. What are fish wings? Give us a look at them. They're yeah, the bottom like chest bit of the fish where they do all their yeah just behind the gills behind the gills yeah and that's um, some of the some of the best meat on the fish yeah we love fish wings they're like more delicious than chicken wings I'd say than yeah. free range chicken wings helps us salvage as much as possible we get a lot of recovery so we're just pretty much throwing in the frame the tail and the head and keep everything else mm, I reckon they're gonna get nice and crispy mm. The old giant chopsticks. Mm. Looky chopsticks. Is it hot enough? Oh yeah, it's bubbling. There we go. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah, it looks real good. More wings, throat latches, chests, whatever you want to call them. Another mangrove jack going in. And a nice little pikey brim. Oh shit. <laughs> a little bit of a dusty pikey brim. Well. Get it ready in the face. How are our fish chips? Fish crackling. Mmm. <laughs> Yum. <laughs> They're good. So deep frying. A lot of people don't eat the wings anyway, and I'd say even less people would eat the fins. But mmm. 
<laughs> In that deep pot, they're pretty good. Mmm. <laughs> Yum. It's really nice. I might turn off this camera and just finish eating this thing then. <laughs> yep. Well, this is a very domestic scene, Pascal. Mm, I've just completed our laundry. And it's drying really quickly, actually. The first load's pretty much dry, so I've started folding it. That's a surprisingly small amount of laundry there. Yeah, I didn't, there isn't any of yours. There's never any of mine because I'm always just wearing the same stuff. But there's a lot of owls. There's three pillowcases and our cushion covers and tea towels and washcloths. So it's mainly just boat stuff. You're just pretending that you let me have any pillow. You're just grubbing. <laughs> and beyond that, there we go. Filling up jerry cans washing ourselves up there is the kitchen someone else has put some rocks there to make a little fire circle that's not something that we like to do so we'll dismantle that once we're all done i even found some alfoil in there so we'll be taking that out as well so if you do have to have a fire it's probably better not to ring it with little rocks <laughs> unless there's some really great idea you know specific purpose for doing so and uh, leaving our foil behind is just, just all bad. So, there you go, there's a rant. After a few days relaxing at Freshwater Bay, we decided to head to the Drysdale River. It seems eerily quiet, Pascal, what's going on? We've, uh, we've sailed out of our anchorage. It's almost... Uh, at Freshwater Bay. It's almost like being back on a sailing boat. I know. Unbelievable. So yeah, that went um, that went nice and smoothly, didn't it? Yeah. Hoist the sail, pull the anchor, didn't even need to use the motor. Got a very favourable breeze. So it's a strong wind warning today. And that means in the Kimberleys we'll probably get a nice 15 knots to yeah. help us get to our next anchorage. So we've gone with it. We anchored at the mouth of the Drysdale River yesterday. And now we're heading in. We've got uh, Pascal and a notebook recording um, the height, like the uh, the shallowest part, the highlights, the high points in the trip. What's our uh, what's what was our shallowest point, Pascal? 0.3 meters at 8:27 a.m. 0.3 meters, so that's 30 centimeters under the keel, isn't it? That's right. That was pretty exciting. So. The reason why we're putting it down in a notebook with the times, uh, we've marked it on the GPS and I'll go back later and, and measure its absolute uh, height at chart datum. So what its absolute height is and then uh, we can apply tides to it. So when we come out, we might be able to just stretch it out to, I don't know, 0 0.5 under the keel or... Maybe even a metre if we're lucky. <laughs> Whoa, let's not get too excited. <laughs> So the sound has returned to some sort of normalcy with a, a meter under us, so it's a bit more comfortable. There's a bunch of bushes growing in the middle of the river. And we always take that as a sign not to drive there. Pascal? Yep, we're here. And it's all worth it. We saw loads of cleanies there, so the fishing is going to be absolutely amazing. Um, you've just had a look at the waterfall where we are. So we've gone from trying to dodge all the shallows to trying to find some shallows. This looks like a very crocodile sort of place, but <laughs> where we are at the moment seems fairly safe. Yeah. Let's just pan up a bit. So this is the sort of thing we like to end our day with. A nice swim. Cold spa. No one rides for free around here. There goes Pascal with her morning exercise regime, tottering around with 40 kilos of water. Soon we're taking the water bottles back. We like to secure them to the side of the dinghy just so they don't fall around. You never know 
what's going to happen at the moment. It's really benign here in the river. But we always just have a just a normal routine. So that if we uh, come out of a river and it's blowing like crazy and there's chop and everything, uh, most things are pretty well secure. You want? Bit of a cranky old queen, this one. Yeah. <laughs> mm. That's a nice little fish. Mm. <laughs> Still got plenty of fight left in it. Mm. You're going to have to play it out. Well, that crocodile makes it here. Where is it? Yeah, it's there, it but it's, it's just floating down to us. Mm. What's going on here? We've got the double hookup. The old double hookup. It's a bit of a standard thing to do when you when you're queenie fishing, I guess. Is there a gaff going? I do. Okay. Oh yeah, okay, it's in the same spot. This tiny little thing. Come in on a rising tide. Yep. We? Just started rising. I think the first few queenies that got caught excited the rest as well. Mm. Okay. Well, this mighty fish is a Queensland groper and it's just one of the regulars at Don's camp. Now this camp used to receive float plane visitors to go barramundi fishing, but um, that's all over now, that's, that's not happening. But there's still often a caretaker, so we just popped in to say hello and to see what other sort of uh, critters were getting around. Yeah. Queensland gropers have an endless appetite, um, and this one was pretty friendly as long as the food kept coming, but we just had to make sure your hands don't go down with the fish. It was a great opportunity to see some Kimberley wallabies up close because they're normally quite shy creatures. Also while I was there I just wanted to swap a bit of information about throwing a cast net, different techniques and things like that. But I was under a bit of pressure from uh, the local audience, so I had to make sure I was right on my game. So it was getting dark, it was time to say goodbye, and part of that goodbye crew was the local crocodile. So we're here on the Drysdale, we're looking for a bit of art. So we've come up above the river, and we haven't found any artwork yet. Like, there hasn't really been any great overnight shelters but it's just a really crazy landscape. It's sort of like an old crumbling wrecked city. And here's the lesser spotted Pascal. So all through the Kimberley we see this massive boulders sort of stacked on each other, but every now and then you'll come across a bit where it's a work in progress. You can see the erosion still happening. Like everything else, these palms are adapted to deal with fires every year.
Now in the Drysdale we saw plenty of big crocs, but you have to start somewhere and this little croc was no exception. He'd obviously learnt that stealing from fishermen was an easy way to get a feed, so he was on the case and even though there was no fish, just going for our lure was enough. Now Pascal, what are you up to this time? Uh, following our track on the way in to get at the hell out of here. To get the hell out of here, how's it been? Um, actually a lot less hair raising than on the way in. The bit where we got a bit got a bit tricky last time, we just kind of went to the deep side of it. Well we enjoyed that. Place the track on the way in, uh, we save that and that just gives us clear water on the way back out. Not only that, we've got a slightly higher tide. We've got another 30 centimetres of tide today as well, so that's right. It's just a little bit more room for error, but we have been doing alright. One meter. Point nine. Jeez. Doesn't even get that shallow in the river properly when you go sailing. No, uh, but when we came in, it was 0.5. Yeah. We went sailing then. We were we were poking them quite good. Point three nine. Look at the dinghy. Loving it. Meow. This is where we've been caught the other way around, in the Mitchell, wind against tide. Yeah, no, this is much nicer. Yeah. I'd probably be a bit irritated actually if we had to go wind against tide here, because it'd be a westerly. And we just haven't seen westerlies. Yeah, that's true. 